ESPN presents Major League Baseball Magazine's Games of the Year. Four select games from 1989 that possessed a certain charm, brevity not included. Well, one more inning and we can vote. We're heading for 21. And that's where we're going. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This game is not over. Walker left too soon. You can bet your life this game will be looked back on often, often, often. This is Warner Fusell for Major League Baseball Magazine. Presented by new wild and mild ranch-flavored Frito brand corn chips. Rustle up some. Last week, us Fritos rustlers came upon a different breed. Ranch Fritos. They looked real wild, but they was actually sort of mild. Shoot, one even let Luke pet it. These wild and mild ranch Fritos have a creamy ranch flavor. No Fritos rustler can resist. Uh, but keep that under your hat, partner. Wild and mild ranch flavor Fritos corn chips. Rustle up, son. The big news in beer just got bigger. Michelob Dry. Old taste. Big enough for two. The 20 ounce bottle is here. High school is just like a memory because. Yeah. So I went. Oh, yeah. I went waiting to see Caroline, right? No. She wasn't yeah. there. Every time I went to the prom, the girl was taller than me. I don't want to talk about it. No, I said I'd like to find a dress. And she said, Is this for your daughter or for mm. your wife? It's, <laughs> it's for my <laughs> wife. <laughs> you know why we don't talk about women? You only talk about things you know about. Levi's 100% cotton dockers. If you're not wearing dockers, you're just wearing pants. Dog pile on John! Yeah! <laughs> Sarah, keep an eye on your brother. No matter what size your business, no matter what size the job, Konica copiers are ready. Konica, capturing the imagination. Our first game of the year took place in June at the Astrodome, a seemingly run-of-the-mill contest between the Astros and the Los Angeles Dodgers. No one gave it much thought when in the sixth, Rafael Ramirez stroked a single to tie the game at four. But from that point on, things began to get a little spacey. Back and forth they went, testing the limits of mediocrity, discovering that time waits for no man, much less an RBI. Fastball popped in the air foul. Davis coming to the Astro dugout. He caught it for the third out, hurtling over the fence. How do you like that? Ball three, and Griffin broke. They've got him in a rundown. Trevino telling the pitcher to cover, and faking now gives the ball to Ramirez, who's going to hold it too long, and Griffin is safely back at first. Scoring runs became something people did a long, long time ago. Swung on, fly ball to center, not very deep. Shelby for the catch. Here comes Reynolds. Here comes the throw. He is out at the plate. The Sandman settled over the dome as Saturday turned to Sunday, and Oral Hershiser turned up for seven innings of relief. Fly ball in the shallow left. Chris Gwynn coming up. This might be close. Poole ties. Chris for the catch. Here comes Poole. Here comes the throw. Here's Sosa blocking the point. He is out again. But while the fielders celebrated their success, batting averages began to tumble. Most notable, John Shelby, whose average dropped double digits in one night. Boy, that is some tough game. John Shelby goes 0 for 10. It's just a frustrating situation to have to go up to the plate knowing that your chances are slim when it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And so when 2.30 comes around and it's a quarter to 3, um, the body starts to talk back to you. Hey, 
Uh, how come we're not in the bed? This is, this is not supposed to happen this way. You, you want me to play tomorrow, you better go to sleep. And so <laughs> I said, we, we're still playing. We got a couple more innings left. Fresh bodies soon became difficult to find. As Tommy Lasorda sums up the situation with a big yawn, Lasorda has used everybody but Tim Belcher and Fernando Valenzuela. So he's used 22 of the 24 players. Belcher had been sent home to rest for the next day's game, but Fernando ended up at first. And that's popped up to Fernando. Eh? We got fun. <laughs> it was easy. It was easy. In the 21st, third baseman Jeff Hamilton came on to pitch. <laughs> got him looking. Strike three call. Breaks the bat over his leg in frustration. It was just mental fatigue more than anything. I wasn't all physically tired. I was just men mentally tired. And uh, he threw a pitch about five feet over my head, and I took a big old hack at it. <laughs> I was surprised at how hard he threw the ball. He, we clocked him at 90 mile an hour. I was saying, geez, oh man, he's throwing harder than their starters. It was like he had been out on the hill before. And we finally got to him the second inning. Hamilton's second inning, the 22nd overall. When with two out and two on, Ramirez ended the marathon. Line drive off Fernando's glove, picked up by Mike Davis. Here comes Doran, and he scores, and it is history. We got a couple breaks there, really. Uh, Fernando was playing first base, and he's a little shorter than Eddie Murray to start with. And, and Rafi hit a line drive to, to right field that Fernando leaped up and just touched it, which slowed the ball down going to right field, which was probably the difference in the play at the plate. But after seven hours and 14 minutes, not everyone wanted to leave. I live about 45 to about 50 minutes away from the ballpark. It was already 4.30 in the morning, and I just said, hey, there's no way that I can go home. I have two little beautiful daughters that every morning come in the room about 8.30, and they say, Daddy, time to get up. You waking up? You waking up? Come on, let's get out of bed. And I said, oh, there's no way that I could wake up to that after playing all those innings, especially uh, being at the ballpark or finishing the game at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I just decided to, to cash it in right there at the ballpark. I called my wife and said, hey, honey, I'm not coming home tonight. I'm staying here. Sunday's game came much too soon for those who'd spent the night. Still, one team seemed unfazed as the Dodgers took a 6 to nothing lead. But Houston battled back. And in the ninth... High fly ball into deep left field. Back goes Gibson. Don't tell me! Craig Biggio ensured another case of extra innings, but this time only until the 13th, when Mike Scott put an end to 35 innings in 24 hours. He has won the center field, the runner tagging, and here comes Ramirez, and he is safe! Ramirez scores, and the Astros win it! The Astros had prevailed again, in a series it simply didn't want to end. In four days, we played 53 innings, which is, I guess, a little about almost about 14 innings per day. But hey, that's what baseball is about. I tell our guys, you're getting paid to do what you used to do all day for nothing as a youngster. Remember I say to him when you were 14, 15, you went out and played baseball all day long, and your mother would call you for dinner, and you would be upset. You don't want to quit playing. Now you're getting paid to do that. What's wrong with playing all day long? At the other end of the spectrum was a game in Philadelphia that lasted just the regulation nine but one in which the Pirates had a first inning indicator that this was going to be their night. Dan Slag with a base hit to right field. Bond scores and the Pirates have the one nothing lead. Base hit to center. Dan Slag will score. Down the left field line. That's gonna score at least two. Base hit to center. 
King scores 5-0. Pirates, Quinones will score at 6-0. The Pirates lead. And Bonds with a drive. Deep right field. Go ball. Get out of here. It's a three-run shot for Bonds. And the Pirates lead 9-0. Base hit to center. The Pirates have reached double figures. A 10-0 lead in the first inning brings out the Yogi in everyone. I looked at the... Uh... Empires, and I said, yeah, we finally got a lead. They said, you finally got a lead in one game. And I said, yeah, but you know, it's it's not over yet. A lot of times during the course of a season, you'll score 10 or more runs in nine innings. And when it happens in the first inning, you're down 10 runs, you got a good chance to come back and win the ball game. But Pirates broadcaster Jim Rooker felt otherwise and led off the bottom of the first with a bold proclamation. Well, a leadoff double for Randy Reddy. Well, I'll tell you something right now. If we lose this game, I'll walk back to Pittsburgh. You'll have to. I won't have to, but I will. <laughs> and from beneath the broadcast mic, the Phillies made plans for Rooker's hike. Right center field, the ball is gone. The Phillies quickly get two runs back in the bottom of the first inning. Still, it looked hopeless. So Philadelphia decided to rest a few vets. We had played a lot of games in a row, so I said, hey, this is a good chance to rest some of my starters. You know, uh, I take Tommy Hur out of the lineup. He gelts out at second base, replacing Tommy Hur. Tom Hur came out after his first at bat, and I went to second base. Uh, my first at bat, I walked Von Hayes, hit his second home run. Deep to right, Hayes with his second home run of the night, and the Pirates lead is now 10-4. to on my second at bat, I came up with a man on against Bob Watt. Threw me an 0-2 curveball, left it over the plate, down and in, kind of. Jelts with a drive to right center. Ball is gone. Jelts with a two-run homer. The Pirate lead is now 10-6. Steve Jelts gets only his third career home run. I could have told you then that there was a good chance we were going to lose that game. When you're a manager, you... Your gut usually tells you that uh, something's not right, it's a freaky thing, and you can usually feel it. But the Pirates added still another run before the Phillies' impromptu slugger once again came to the plate. And they will bring up Babe Ruth. Yes. Third time I came up, I had two men on uh, against Bob Kipper. Threw me a 2-0 and fastball up and in. A drive to left field. Bonds is back to the warning track for the wall. It's gone. I don't even, I don't believe it. It's now 11 to 9. And these fans who came into the ballpark tonight were stunned by a pin run first inning by the Pirates now on their feet, cheering their Phillies who have made a tremendous comeback to make it an 11 to 9 ball game. And they want a curtain call for Steve Jeltz. And when Jeltz dings you twice, it's just a matter of time. This has become a bad dream. Jordan with a ground ball through the middle. Quinones cuts it off. It's 11 to 10. I think it was Freddie's revenge at the time. The ball game is going to be tied. Ground ball up the middle. Leaned off his glove. One run scores. Coming around is Dernier. He'll score. The throw to third not in time. Phillies lead 13 to 11. Five ball into left center field. John Cruck over. He's there. The Phillies bounce back from a 10-0 deficit. They beat the Pirates the final 15 to 11. And so there was this matter of a walk through Coatesville and Lancaster and Shippensburg and Gettysburg. If we lose this game, I'll walk back to Pittsburgh. You know, when you make a statement like that, it's, obviously you're thinking that's the last thing in the world you're going to have to do. His fear are going to do the talking for him. There's no question about that. I think that you have to school yourself to say those things among yourselves between innings. Never say something like that on the air. And believe me, we've been even more careful ever since Rooker got into trouble. <laughs> but you're a man of your word, and you're going to make the walk. Indeed he did leaving the vet October 5th, destined to arrive in Pittsburgh 12 days later with some newfound bunions and a humble resolve. Boy, that's a long walk.
Who would have thought that the Cubs in late August would still be on top in the East? But there they were, in a pivotal game against Houston in what would become a game of the year. The Cubs began digging their grave in the second when the Astros loaded the bases against Mike Bilecki and Rafael Ramirez forced a faux pas. Now the delivery. Ground ball, they won't get a double play. Out is wild throw in the right field. Two run score, runners at second and third. Dunson threw the ball away. Ramirez struck again in the fourth with a two run double. Then Granley fanned the flames in the fifth. Now Ramirez drives one high and deep to left. McClendon back on the track and that ball's gone. He left it up and Ramirez hit it out. A grand slam home run for Rafael Ramirez. Ramirez now has seven runs batted in in this game. One in the second inning, two in the fourth, and four here in the fifth on a grand slam home run. And just like that, it's a five-run inning and a nine-to-nothing ball game. By the sixth inning, we were losing uh, nine to nothing, and, and nine to nothing. Pretty much, most teams are going to lay down, especially that late. I mean, it happened earlier in the season where teams were were ahead by that many early in the game, but this was the, the sixth inning, and we only had three more times at bat. Ah, but Wrigley is no stranger to strangeness, and the Cubs began their own chapter in the sixth. Mark Grace was on second, Sean Dunstan at bat, and Mark Portugal got a chop. Big chop off the plate, Portugal backing down off the mound, barehanded pick up, and he throws it away. The run will score, and Dunstan's on his way to second, so the Cubs pick up a run. Dunstan, too, eventually scored. Then in the seventh, Lloyd McClendon with a man aboard. There's a drive in the center field, way back, might be, hit it! A nine to four game, and the Cubs now trail only by five. When the wind's blowing out in Wrigley Field, you always know that no lead is safe. And we scored nine quick runs off of them, and I, when you're in that situation, you know it can happen the other way. And it was just one of those things where I brought in four or five relievers and every one of them gave up a hit to the first man they faced. And, and once a snow, that snowball starts rolling, it, it sometimes you can't stop it, and that's exactly what happened. The snowball cut the lead to nine to eight in the eighth, when with a runner on third, Dwight Smith made the kind of sacrifice that makes for games of the year. There's a fly ball. From a 9-0 deficit to a 10th inning triumph, once again, Dwight Smith. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Holy cow! Cubs win! After being behind, 9 to nothing, And look at them, the red mobbing Dwight Smith, who drove in the tying run, and now the winning run. What a victory! When the game is over and you go in and you face the media and so forth, their first reaction is, boy, what this will do to your club, you allow me to win six in a row. Well, that stopped in a hurry because Mike Scott beat us the very next night. Our final game of the year took place in Montreal, with the Dodgers matching up Oral Hershiser against the Expos' Pasquale Perez. Pitching duel, right? Precisely. But who could have guessed 21 scoreless innings and a six-hour, 14-minute marathon that showed no sign of letting up? The Pasquale pitch hit on the ground to Foley, who will throw Griffin out, and the inning is over. First time tonight we've seen the Pasquale pitch. It was the one-two pitch. Struck him out swinging, a slider down and away. Again, Hershiser knows what he's doing out there. There may not be a lot of runs scored in this here baseball game with these two fellas pitching. 
to this point, Jerry, wouldn't you have to say that the stuff by both pitchers has been darn good? This is true. But while the pitchers pranced like peacocks, the hitters failed to find a way to light the fire. Then in the eighth, the Dodgers lost their starting catcher as Mike Sosha pulled a hamstring. And was only fair that since the Dodgers lost a key performer, the Expos had to lose one too. There was no joy in Montreal. The mighty Yuppie was out. They want Yuppie off the Dodger dugout. He's bugging the Dodger players and Tom Lasorda is out. And third base umpire Bob Davidson is throwing Yuppie out of the ball game. He wants him off the Dodger dugout. Tommy Lasorda has put up a complaint. This will draw the ire of the fans. They're calling somebody no. from security They're over. They're going to call security and remove him from the ballpark. We've seen it all now, huh? Yuppie's been thrown out of the game off the Dodgers <laughs> dugout. Well, if you're sitting in that dugout, which has a tin roof on the top of it, and this guy keeps jumping up and down on that, that's uh, <laughs> pretty disturbing, I would have to say. So I merely suggested to him that if he wanted to jump on the dugout, why doesn't he jump on the home team's dugout, too? That guy, he deserved it. He was a real pain. The Dodgers had other problems, like 22 straight innings without drawing a walk. Harris at third, Murray at first, and he struck him out on a palm ball. Brent Smith gets out of the inning. Hatcher goes down swinging. Everyone here knows that he's capable of ending it with one swing. The 0-2 pitch. Called third strike, he struck out the side. Five strikeouts for Pena. He's nasty. Finally, a Montreal rally in the 16th filled the bags with just one out. Infield in, outfield in, and visions of bedtime danced in Mike Fitzgerald's head. Through one trying to score, he's going to be... Sorry, the Expos win! Larry Walker slides in under the tag by Dempsey. And now the Dodgers will appeal to see if he left too soon. And he did. He is out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This game is not over. Walker left too soon. Again, in the bottom of the 21st, the Expos sought to end the string of goose eggs. Two on, two out for Tim Wallach. But the man who replaced Sosha came up big. Here's the pitch. And it's high. A pickoff throw to first. And Reigns is going to be out. They picked Reigns off. I watch Eddie at first base, and uh, there was an old sign that Eddie used to have, uh, you know, uh, used to give me in Baltimore, and it just kind of came back to me. I saw Eddie giving me that sign, and, and I said, oh, heck, why not? You know, when the pitch was on its way, I could see from peripheral vision Eddie was breaking, boom, I just let it go to first base, and we got it. It was like the old days. And how often do you see it? A guy makes a great play and then leads off the top of the 22nd. This ball game now has the Dodgers on top. One to nothing on a long home run by Rick Dempsey on a 2-1 pitch into the bleachers in left field. The Dodgers super sub had them now leading by a thread. And the eye of the needle stared back blankly at the Expos. And although Montreal got a man to first in the bottom of the 22nd with two outs, the Dodgers sewed it up. Hudler running, the pitch is high, the throw by Dempsey will be in time and the ball game is over. You can almost bet your paycheck that, the, that he's going to run with two strikes because he can't give the hitter a chance to strike out. We had him the whole way. I could have ate a sandwich before I threw that ball down there. With Dempsey doing everything but rolling out the tarp, the man he replaced had a game or two to recover. I was hurt in the eighth inning. By the time the game was over, I was, I was healed and ready to go. It was fun to win that ball game. This is Warner Fusell. Major League Baseball Magazine is presented by New Watch.